Test 1, obviously. Sections 1, 1 through 2, 3. Okay, the beginning stuff should have been relatively easy, but let's just quickly talk about what was in 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, 2, that range. We talked about types of numbers. We talked about real numbers, imagine, uh, rational numbers, irrational. Uh, we talked about integers, whole numbers, um, and the natural numbers. Okay, do you remember that idea of number sets? I can tell you now, you'll definitely have a question on the test, but not too much on that. Like one or two questions about that. So if I gave you a number and you had to classify it, so for example, like the number seven, what categories would that fall into? What would the number seven be? A whole number. What else could it be? It's a natural number. What else? A real number. A real number? An integer. And an integer. Uh, and one other. Rational. And it's rational. So that has five of those categories in a sense. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, so if I give you a number and ask you, tell me the type of number this is, and write down all types of numbers that apply, it's not just one answer. It's not just a real number. It's real, rational, whole, natural, and an integer. It's all those things. Okay, so maybe I'll give you some sort of a, like a, a bank of types. i will say natural, real, whole, all the different types, and you have to put the letters in the right spot. It's a good way to think about that for practice. Um, you should know which sets are within which sets. So the overall set of numbers is the real numbers. Within that, we have rational and irrational. Within the rational, then, we go into our subcategories. We go into integers and whole natural. So know how they work one within the next. That's what we made that, we made that little diagram, showing which were within each. So we know the whole group and then the subgroups of that. Um, what else was in one? One, two, through like one, five. The rest was like properties. Distributive property. Okay, remember this is the distributive property. Okay, actually distributing, thus the distributive. Commutative property of multiplication or addition. Commutative just means you can switch them. All right, that's commutative. Associative of addition or multiplication. Associative is who you associate with, remember who the groups of friends you have are. So right away, think of the word grouping. Grouping means the parentheses are moving along. Okay? Um, so we have distributive, associ uh, commutative, associative for our three main properties. Then there were a bunch of other things we talked about. What were the other ones? Identity property. So that could be for multiplication or addition. What's the identity element for multiplication? The identity element. One. Why is that? Can somebody explain? Because when you add a number to one, it's a multiply number by one, to the same exact number. Good. And then for adding, it would be? Zero. Identity element is zero. Add zero to anything, it's the same number. It's identical. Thus, identity element. Um, substitution principle. Okay? All you have to remember for this substitution principle is if at some point along the way, you just replace something. So if you had like, and then it became seven on the next line as you're going down your steps, that's the substitution principle from here to here, all right? When you're naming the principles and properties, you need to think about what happens from one step to the next, and that answer goes on the next line. So this is where I would write that answer. Some of you are writing them on the wrong lines. Okay, that's substitution from here to here. So you think about successively what caused that next line, and that goes on the next line. Um, let's see. In 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, that range, it was like adding, multiplying, dividing. Some of the properties that were useful, you need to remember that when we multiply two things that are opposites, it's negative. If they're the same, it's positive. Raising numbers to powers, like negative 3 to the third is going to be negative still, because it's negative, negative, negative multiplying. Whereas negative 3 squared is positive, because it's negative 3 times negative 3. What else? Did you have other questions from that range of numbers? From 1, 1 through like 1, 6? No? Okay. 1, 7 was just solving regular one variable equations, right? One variable equations. So for that, let's take a look at just a simple example. Okay, you should be able to solve these real quick like that. So if you had 2x plus 4 equals 3x minus 7, and you're asked to solve for x. Okay, stuff that you've seen before, probably in 8th grade, maybe even 7th grade at some point, right? Alright, so distribute to start. 
giving you 2x plus 8 equals 3x minus 7. Subtract the 2x over here, giving that x. And at the same time, add the 7 to both sides, making the right side 15. Okay, this cancels, this cancels. 3x minus 2x gives me x. 8 plus 7 is 15. Please do these quickly. Hey, please don't dilly-dally on the test on these problems. These are ones that should take you like a minute maximum. That took us about 15 seconds to do just there. If you have time at the end, what should you do? Yeah, check. Please don't check in the middle of the test. Check at the end. Okay, check at the end. I always, I don't know what that is about some students. People hound on checking right away. Checking, the idea is if you have more time, right? You have more time. Please don't check in the beginning and then you're going to run out of time at the end and say, I have, no, I have no time left, I need more time. Okay, so do the test first. If you have more time, then you have the opportunity to check. If you run out of time, then you can't check your answers. Okay? Um, what else in 1-7? Anything else from 1-7 that you had questions about? What happens if we get an answer that says like 5 equals 12 and all the X's drop off? Uh, empty set. Cor correct. Why? Is 5 equal to 12? It's not true. It's not true. It's a contradiction. Contradiction tells us that there is no solution. Okay? What if I got something that said like 5 equals 5? So what is the answer? Five. What do we say? There's, a, there's another saying, not close. Here's another saying. It's like all real numbers. All real numbers. Okay, the solution is all real numbers. For example, simply put, ready? I mean, the easiest example ever, if you had something like this. Right? 2x equals 2x. What number is going to fill in for x? Anything. Pick a number. Put it in for x. It's true still, isn't it? This is an example of where all real numbers would be a solution. If you tried to solve by dividing by 2, you get x equals x. Well, that's the same statement, so this is all real numbers. Okay, I write it like that, or I say x is in a set of all real numbers. Uh, let's see. That was it for section 1-7. I'm going to go back to 1-8 and 1-9 in a second. Let's do 2-1 and 2-2 quickly, because it's along the same lines. 2-1 and 2-2 was inequalities, but solving them the same way. What was the one thing we really needed to remember for them when we're solving? Yeah, not just dividing, but... Yeah. Dividing or multiplying by a negative, you flip the direction of the inequality sign. All right? For compound inequalities, compound inequalities, how many types of them do I have? How many types of compound inequalities do I have? Yeah, what are they? And statements and or statements. Yeah, conjunction for and... Disjunction for OR statements. AND statements are traditionally written as follows. You see something like this. Okay? That's the way you'll see an AND statement written, as one giant compound inequality. Whereas an OR statement, you'll see the word OR in the statement. Okay, it's obvious. How do I solve this, Sabine? What could I do? Yeah, what would it look like? Go ahead. And? Okay, so again, we break it up into two parts. This is the spot we talked about yesterday real quick. Somebody asked a question about this, how to do this part. Okay, so we circle this area, and then think about like boxing in this side over here, and just break it up. Now, when you get two answers, what did I suggest you should do before you come up with your solution set? Graph it. Yeah, please graph it first. Okay, please graph it first. Oops. Okay, please graph it first. Let me get back to this marker. So if I solve this, I'd subtract 4 over here, getting negative 9. And I'd subtract 4 over here, giving me 3. So if I read this, how would I read this left statement? How would I read it? And please read it the way I've been asking you to read it. Okay, how would I read this? What would it say? X is greater than or equal to negative 9. Very good, Paul. Okay? If you read it the other way, it doesn't make much sense. Saying negative 9 is less than or equal to x. Speak with the variable first. So x is greater than or equal to negative 9. And, right? And, and I, you don't have to do this, but sometimes I write the word and to remind myself that I started with an and statement. Over here, x is less than or equal to 3. So, on the number line, what do I do? You plot down 9 and 3, and then you draw a line going, showing 
most of that to move on. And in this case, it's still at with a closed circle. Okay, so the nine is this way, and the three is this way, right? Because x is greater than or equal to negative nine, so it's to the right. X is less than or equal to three, to the left. And then what do we look for? What do we look for? Yeah, any overlapping, God bless you. Any overlapping, which is clearly obvious right here to right here in that middle region. So the solution set would really just look like this. Okay, those are closed in circles. How would I write that in solution set form now? What's the last step? How do I write that from the number line? From the number line, how do I write that? Mike? Uh, negative 9 is less than or equal to uh, x is less than or equal to 3. Okay. Now, remember, these numbers on the outside are just really endpoints. That's all they are. They're endpoints. If you have a less than or equal to, instead of a less than, it means they're closed circles. Okay, so we have closed circles above there. Questions on compound inequalities? There are other two options, right? Remember, no solution or all real numbers? What do those look like for answers? What kind of answers do you get? Like, give me a, give me a possible answer for real numbers. What would a solution look like that really yields all real numbers? Yeah, perfect, Kelly. If you get a statement at the end where all the x's drop off and that statement is true, that means the solution is really all real numbers. If that statement is false, what is it? It's a question. Do you want If that statement is false, what do we know? It's a solution. Yeah, it's no solution. That's fine. No solution if it's false, okay? So again, this is all real numbers for a number line. And when you shade in a number line with all real numbers, just Shade in both directions, showing that it's all real numbers. An empty set on a number line would just be an empty number line. And that would come about if you had something like this. Okay, 8 is not greater than 10. This is no solution. And remember, this only happens when all the x's have a tendency to drop off. Only when the x's drop off. That's when we're at, or the variables drop off. Okay? All right, now let's go back to 1, 8, 1, 9, and 2, 3. The stuff that I think we need to focus on more than anything else. Sections, what did we do? What did we do in 1.8? Yeah, and in 1.8 specifically, didn't we start writing algebraic expressions only? Then in 1.9 we worked on solving, 1.9 we worked on solving them. So, how would I write the following down? In variables. A number is four times bigger or four times larger than another number Another number is square. One number is four times bigger than another number's square. What would that expression look like, Luca? 4x equals y squared. Say again? 4x equals y squared. Not 4x equals y squared. Not 4x equals y squared. Close, though. You're on the right track. We mix and close. Um, n over 4 equals x squared. N over 4 equals x squared. Okay. I wouldn't write it that way, but that works. I would just write it as n equals 4x squared. I was thinking about the way you're doing it in your head. This is how, right? If a number is four times larger, four times, a square or another number, just write it out the way you hear it. You don't have to divide by four there. Okay? So if a number, a number, x, is or a number n is four times larger, so put four times larger than the square of another number right there. Um, what about a problem where we had, let's see, one side of a triangle is four times larger than the first side of the triangle, and the third side is three less than the second side. So again, the second side of a triangle is four times larger than the first, and the third side is three less than the second side. Now, writing those sides out is the starting point, and then based on the problem we can solve, what would those look like? Not angles, not angles, sides. Just give me the sides. You always, you try and do too much. 
Just give me the three signs. Go ahead. So X is one side, okay? You're not, why are you adding them together? You didn't give any statement. Just, just give me the three sides. So X. And 4X minus 3. This is the second side. Remember, a side is four times larger than the first side, and then the third side is three less than the second side. So we've got to use 4X for the second side, okay? So this is our second side. This is the first side. This here is the third side. Now, following that up, if you were given some piece of information about the perimeter, then you would sum them together and set them equal to the perimeter. So if it said the perimeter of the triangle were equal to 45, you'd add those three values or those three expressions together, giving you 9x minus 3, set that equal to 45, and solve for x. Okay? Well. On the test, do you want us to take those numbers and form them into an equation, not necessarily solve it, it's something like this? Well, this I just asked for the expression. If you're given a word problem, then you need to make an equation and go ahead and solve. Depends on the situation. If part of the test, I might say, write an expression, right, down for this. What is an expression? What's an expression? Um, my word. Equal yeah, there's no equal sign. It's variables or numbers or some sort of combination of numbers and operations, but no equal sign. So you need to know your vocabulary in math. If you give an equation, it's completely wrong. It's not an expression. Okay, if it says write an expression to describe the second side in terms of the first side, this would be that expression right here. If it said, you know, solve for the side length of each, then you need an equation and you gotta go solve. So it really just depends on the problem. There's no one right or wrong. Okay? Um, let's see. How about the problem set last night? Were there ones that you struggled on? Maybe word problems that we can go over that you might have had trouble with? Mike, what do you got? What number? Uh, I like In section 2, 3, number 4? Yeah. All right, give me one sec. Let me pull it up. Kelly, why don't you grab some water if your throat's hurting? You sure? Yeah, I'm okay. All right. All right. The first one in section 2 3, you said? Number four? Is the one with the triangles? It's not loaded. Anybody have the book open in front of them or the word problem in front of them? They can read it real quick. Number four on section 2 3. Thanks, Tyler. Again, guys, I'm deleting the first chapter out of the Dropbox folder. I'm going to do it. I, I left it in there because a few people asked. But you need to save these in your iBooks. Every chapter, you should have an iBook. So in iBooks right now, you should have Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. So if you don't, just go to Dropbox real quick while you're sitting here waiting. Go to Dropbox and hit Open In. And open them in iBooks, and they'll stay in iBooks. Okay? Go ahead, now. Perimeter is between, what is it? Sixteen and? Thank you. So that's what I know from what he just said. I was, you read that the legs of the triangle are twice the base. So call the base x, call the legs 2x. Or I think it said the base was half the legs. Either way, it's the same thing, right? Then we're told that the perimeter lies between 6 and 16. How do I find the perimeter of any triangle? Or any polygon, really? Yeah. So how many axes do I have, Nick? Three. Add them up, though. I have three legs. How many? We have 2x plus 2x plus x gives me? There it is. Okay. So there's three legs, yeah? And together, the sum of the legs gives you 5x. So it's just a compound inequality problem. Okay, so if you solve it, let's solve it. Divide everything by five. So what could x be? It said they were integer values, right? It said the legs were integer values. So x needs to be an integer. What integers exist between these two values? Two. 
Well, we're going to get to the legs, yeah, but just for x for now. Just for x for now. If, I have solved, if I'm trying to solve for x here, 2 and 3 are the options, right? x could be 2 or 3 because they're integers. So this could be, God bless you, 2 or 3. So therefore, this could be 4 or 6. Okay, Paul. Okay. Um, let me try and either find one or come up with one. Perfect. What what uh what number? One eight. One eight number eight. Okay. Why don't you read it to us, nice and loud, Paul? All right, so because it's decreasing its speed, how do we do this problem? What do we have to do? What do to, how do we start this? <laughs> Wrong class. How do we start this problem? Nobody did this right? You have your problem sets in notability right in front of you, don't you? What's the formula to always use? Always? All right, good. That, that's the starting point, right? Always. D equals RT. Now, we could say that D1, right? D1, the beginning piece, is equal to R times 2, because it's how many hours? In the beginning, is 2 hours, right? Uh, yeah. Then D2 would be R minus 10 times 1 hour. Why did I put R minus 10 there? 10 mile an hour is slower than the first one. Okay, now, what do I know about D1 and D2 together? We're trying to figure out the total length of the trip, right? This is 1 8, so we're just setting up expressions. There's no numerical answers, remember. So, what can I do to figure out the total length of the trip? Just add them together. Remember, I think, Paul, I think what's maybe confusing you for some of these. You're not asked to solve for an actual value. 1, 8 was all come up. You have to read in the directions. It would say, write the expression that represents this problem. So we're trying to find out the total distance, which is d1 plus d2. So this is 2r times d1. This is 1 times r minus 10, or just plus r minus 10. So the answer is 3r minus 10. Okay, it's an expression in terms of the rate. Are you given the rate in the problem? You're not given a rate, so you can't actually figure out the distance. But let's say the, the original rate was like 15 miles per hour. You plug in a 15 here, this becomes a 5, or just plug in a 15 in the answer. Okay, it's just an expression. That's all the answer looks like. Uh, I'm about one from 1, 9. Let me see if there's anything good from 1, 9. How about number six on one nine? Can somebody read number six in section one nine for us? Nick, read it nice and loud for us. If one of the side of the square is increased by eight centimeters and then adjacent side is increased by two centimeters, a rectangle is formed is formed whose perimeter is forty centimeters. Find the length of the side of the square. So that's what I see right away. And now I need to write in my dimensions on the rectangle. Nick, read that again slowly, what it does, how, this, how the shape changes. If one side does what? If one side is increased by 8 centimeters. Alright, so hold on. Let's do this then, right? And the other is? And the adjacent side is increased by 2 centimeters. So that's what we've got, really. Okay? It's a rectangle. Those are the dimensions given. If I know the perimeter of the rectangle, what do I do? Again, we did this two seconds ago. Add them all together. Add them all together. All right, x plus 8 plus x plus 8 plus x minus 2 plus x minus 2. And that is equal to 40. All right, so you should be able to do a geometric problem for sure. We have to at least draw a diagram. You could solve this for x. You'll get 4x plus 12 on the right-hand side. Solve for x. And x was defined as the side length of the square. And since the problem said find the side length of the square, once you get x, you're done. But if the problem said find the dimensions of the rectangle, you'd have to then just see what the dimensions were. 
Okay, 40 equals 4x plus 12. Subtract 12 gives me 28. So x equals 7 in this problem. If x is 7, that means that the dimension of this rectangle is 5 by what? 7 and 8, 15. Okay, those are the dimensions of the rectangle. 5 by 15, whereas the square's dimensions are 7 by 7. When you give answers for these, and you're asked for a length or a dimension, please use units. So I don't, I don't remember what the units were. Were they centimeters? Yes. All right, so just put centimeters, please. So each of these we'll put centimeters next to. So we know what units we're in. Um, by the way, did you recognize number nine? It was the same problem you had in your quiz? Yeah. Um, yeah. With the 1,200 and the 2,100? What about number 12? Did people struggle with number 12? Because we didn't do one of those in class, but it is a word problem type. Can you read that again for me real quick? Kelly, you want to read it? Thanks. This is number 12 in section 1-9. So how much money did this person make all together? How much money does it say in the very beginning of the problem? How many dollars? Mike? 3, how many? 3, That's what they invested, 3,000. What did they make? Uh, yeah, 213 is the amount they made. So that's going to equal the overall interest. Now, they invested part of the 3,000 at one rate and part of it at another rate. Okay? So let's say the first, the first rate was 5% and the second rate was 8%. Okay? So let's say that they invested a certain amount X. X is the amount invested at 5%. If I invest X amount of dollars and I know I'm going to get 5% interest, how does interest work? How do you know how much interest, how much money you're going to get? What do you do with those numbers? You take the amount you invested, X, and multiply by the investment rate, which is 0 0.05. 0 0.05 is really 5%. Move the decimal two spots, it becomes 5%. Now that's part of the investment. If X is invested at that amount, what's left over from the amount you started with? How much did you invest altogether? How much money was it? What was the total number? The total number. 3,000 was the total number. So if I invest X at 5%, how much is left at 8%? How much of this is left at 8%? Again, I'm investing X, which is a part of it. What do you got, Nina? 3, yeah, 3,000 is the total you have. You've already invested X of it. So what's left over is 3,000 minus X. And this is the amount, AMT, invested at 8%. And since it's at 8%, I'm going to use 0.08 here. And instead of x, I'm using 3,000 minus x. Okay, so it's one equation. It's just messy. It's just messy, that's all. Okay, I recommend just distributing the 0.08 or maybe even multiplying by 10 to start the problem off. Multiply everything by 10. This becomes 5x, or 100, sorry, 100, not 10. Okay, that becomes 5x plus 3,000 minus x times 8 equals 21300. Just makes it a lot easier to solve, doesn't it? Looking at it like this without the decimals. So if you need to move the decimals two spots, multiply by 100. Remember that you are distributing this 100 here and here. You cannot multiply it by both of these. That's the common mistake. People multiply the 100 by all of these things. That's not true. It's one or the other. Whenever you distribute to something that's a product, you distribute it to one or the other. So I would not distribute it this way. I would do it like that. Okay, distribute it only to the 0.08. And that's how you get the next line. And then you could solve for x. Okay, what does x give me at the end? If I get x equals, I don't know, say x equals $2,000. What is that representing? What is that representing? 
Five percent. So you need to be able to give a verbal statement at the end of these problems. That's that kind of question there. That's the kind of way you responded. You would say, two thousand dollars was invested at five percent, and one thousand dollars dollars was invested. God bless you at eight percent. Okay, that's your verbal statement at the end of the problem. Question. Oh, I don't. I could look up what the answer was, but yeah. Uh, let's see. That was hypothetical, Kelly. This the answer was yeah, nine hundred at five percent and twenty one hundred at eight percent. Okay, if you're if you're checking or if you want to know. <clears throat> uh, um, let's see. Any other ones that you, I'm looking at them, just trying to find one that's tough that'll be good for the test. Any others that you struggled with that you want to ask about specifically? Well. It was a what? Oh, in one seven? Do you have the problem in front of you by any chance? Can anybody find that? In one seven, historical note number three. Was the last problem you had to do? Oh, I remember this one. Go ahead. Number three. Section one seven, historical note number three. This was just tricky just to see how you guys were gonna think. So anybody solve this and actually get through it? What do you have to do? What do you have to do for this problem? It's a system of equations. So the first one we have, if B gives, go ahead, say it again. So these are the statements, and let's, let's go through these real quick. So if B gives A $7, what does that do to the amount that A has? It increases it by 7. And we're told that now A has 5 times as much as B had, but it's no longer B because B lost 7. So if I give you $7, not only do you have 7 more, I now have 7 less. That's where the minus 7 comes in, and you now have 5 times as much as me, so you have 5 times as much as what I had, and this is what you have. Now, vice versa, it says, if B gives, if, no, if A gives B five, so if A gives B five bucks, B's increased by five, A has decreased by five. But we're told that B now has seven times what A had. So you end up with two equations and two variables. Um, if you struggled solving this, don't worry too much because we didn't get the systems. But all you have to do here is solve for one in terms of the other. So in the top or bottom equation, you can pick. Which one do you want to solve for A or B? Uh, a. In the top one? Yeah. All right, so solving for A in the top one, what do you get? Uh, yep. What do you get when you solve for A in the top one, though? Very good. So this is the expression. This is what you get for A in the first one here. Okay? So what do you get for A? That's what you get for A. But that's not a number, obviously. So the way to solve this is we take this and plug it in. Okay? Don't worry about this for tomorrow's test. Okay? If it was a question on the problem set, I understand. But don't worry about doing systems for tomorrow. But that's how you would do this. You would take this expression right here and plug it in for A, giving you B plus 5 equals 7 now for A, we put in that whole expression. 5B minus 42 minus 5. Okay, that's a 42. And then at this point, look at the equation that's written in black. B is the only variable missing or unknown. You could solve for B. 
Once you get B, you can get A by plugging, it, say B turned out to be 5, you plug it in back down here at the bottom, and you then get A. Right? But the important part, the reason I gave you this problem was not to confuse you with systems, but was just to see if people could even set it up. Okay, so the setup is the important part, and this is the setup. All right? Remember, if you give somebody a certain amount of an item you have, not only do they gain that amount, but you lose that amount. So B in the first case gave person A seven dollars. So person A went up by seven dollars, person B went down by seven dollars. And then at the end it says that person A now has five times what person B has, so you put a five out in front of person B. Okay, and then the opposite goes for the second scenario. Uh, you want to know the format of the test? Would that be useful? Okay, let me give you the format right now. Uh, if I can find it, hold on. Um, I made the test last night. It's long, I'll tell you that now. I'm tempted to give you everything besides the word problems tomorrow, and maybe do the word problems uh, on Monday. Hey, I'm tempted to, I don't know. It depends on how long it takes, so I have to think about it. All right. So you're starting with six multiple choice problems. They're relatively easy. Like they should take you very little time. Simple stuff. Like simplifying algebraic exp arithmetic expressions. Or, you know, substituting in for x and y to give you a value. Or solving a simple equation in terms of x. Or not in terms of x, for x. Um, or looking at a graph of a number line. Like if I gave you a number line with the shaded and closed in circle, and there were four choices, and it said, which choice represents the number line? You just have to match up the one that it is. Uh, let's see. So six multiple choice. Then you're going to have a bunch of short answer stuff. A lot. Um, I don't know how many. Let me see how many total. There's a lot of them. Like some of them simple as like list, you know, whole numbers, or tell me what whole numbers are. Or what's the identity element for multiplication? Stuff like that, like quick answers. Like you can answer that within like literally five seconds. Okay, if it takes you time to think about this stuff, you're never gonna finish. So you need to be quick with what you're doing. Uh, two true or false ones. You know, like for example, an even times an even, or uh, not even even, yeah, an even times an even is an odd. Is that true or false? So stuff that you can answer very quickly, okay? Stuff that you don't need to think about for a while. There are a lot of them. Um, I don't even know how many total. Probably like about 30 of those. Um, definitely some of those have to do with number types. Integers, rational, irrational. Um, one question within those that has like the steps naming the properties the whole way through. Simple stuff. Like real simple stuff. Like minus a negative knowing that that's positive. So like if you had 7 minus negative 3. It's just 10, because minus a negative is a positive. Stuff that we talked about quickly in like 1, 4, 1, 5, and 1, 6. And there's like five or six of those. So those should take you like five seconds, 10 seconds each. You should take no more time than that. Um, let's see. Solving like inequalities, but they're just equations. So that might take you like a minute per problem there. So the short ones, you need to really emphasize, or really need to work at a pace that is much higher than the word problems. So when the problems are really short, it should take you like five, ten seconds. You can't sit there and think about it for like 30 seconds, or you're going to run out of time for short. At the end, you have to choose three of four word problems. Okay, you're going to be given four word problems to end the test. You choose three of them. I'll give you a hint. One of them will be distance rate. One of them will be, or two of them will be inequality word problems. Maybe the one like the calculator one would be a good one to study with the profit, with the, remember the revenue and the cost. Um, and remember in the very beginning where we solved algebraically in a formula, for example, something like area of a cylinder, the surface area of a cylinder is equal to 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. Okay, that's the surface area of any cylinder. 
and I tell you solve for H. Okay? So we did these in class where you solve algebraically. How would you solve this for H? And you could do it more than one way, so I'll accept other ways. How would I go ahead and solve this for H? Nina, what would I do? Start by subtracting that first. Very good. Good. So remember, when you're solving for a variable, here's the variable we're solving for. Think of everything else as a number. If you had this, right? If you had 5 equals 3 plus 2h, that is the easiest thing in the world to solve. It's the same exact thing. Look at the line above. 5 is now a. 3 is now this entire expression. 2 is really this entire coefficient. How would you solve the top? You'd subtract 3, right? Wouldn't you subtract the 3 over? So subtract the 2 pi r squared over. Then once you subtracted the 3 up top, you would divide by the 2 in front of the h. Now you have a 2 pi r in front, so divide by 2 pi r. And that's the expression for h. Okay, so knowing how to do that. Um, if everybody turned in their problem sets, I'll put up the solution at some point today. Okay, so just look for that. If somebody forgot, I'm not going to put the solution up. If you didn't get it done, you want to tell me right now, you can. That's fine. Just come over here and tell me. But I'm going to check anyway, or I think uh, Mr. Brereton checked anyhow.